motto by Ernest Cline is a self-indulgent geeky fantasy riffing on stories like Ender's Game, War Games, and The Last Starfighter to produce a story about video game nerds saving the planet from an alien invasion. Armada follows Klein's previous success Ready Player One in geeky gamer fantasies with retro appeal. While Armada is not as firmly grounded in 80s nostalgia as Ready Player One, the protagonist's daddy issues lead him to indulge in all of his father's geeky interests, and spout as many 80s pop culture references as that of the present day, giving it a similar feel of geeky nostalgia. I actually didn't make it all the way through Ready Player One, as I found Klein's tone filled with the masculine standoffishness in common with the worst parts of geeky culture. I was glad I dropped it when I ran across a blog post discussing the book's sexism and transphobia. This was clearly not a book for people like me, but instead for the macho jackasses of 80s nostalgia. With this in mind, I approached Armada with trepidation, but I was pleasantly surprised. While there is still some of that annoying masculine standoffishness to the tone, the book in general seems to be a male fantasy cleaned up of the problems of the last book. I imagine he received feminist criticism and, as a result, went to efforts to keep his second foray into science fiction appropriately respectful, which is deserving of some praise. Good job! The book's premise is that the Earth has secretly been at war with Europa, a moon of Jupiter, since the 1970s. NASA discovered a giant swastika painted on the moon, and the United States kept the news secret out of fear that conflation with the Nazi symbol would lead to a mass panic. NASA sent a probe to make contact with the Europeans, but the probe's damage to the swastika symbol was misinterpreted as an act of war. The Europans retaliated with remote-operated drone ships, constructed in orbit of the moon. NASA took pictures of this process and was able to reverse-engineer the drone ships. A secret Earth Defense Alliance was established, a worldwide organization to build drones and send them out to combat European drones, essentially playing a giant video game against aliens. The EDA needed the best of the best to operate these controls, and they decided that the best thing to do was to manipulate the entertainment industry to secretly train civilians to operate their combat drones, and to be prejudiced against aliens. The entire video game industry was created to train civilians on a massive scale, and that's what separates it from The Last Starfighter most dramatically. Though there is a pair of games, Armada and Terra Firma, that specifically teach people to operate their combat drones, it's not isolated to those games. All video games are EDA propaganda based off of engagements with the Europans. So when the Europans display video game cliches, it's not so much an homage to video games as it is a nod to video games being designed off of their behavior. It's a bit like Pixels, except there is a better justification for the aliens attacking us in video game patterns. It's not hard to be better than Pixels. The book stars high school student Zachary Ulysses Lightman. Given Klein's penchant for geeky 80s references, I think it's no coincidence that his initials spell out <laughs> Zach is a standard geeky teenage boy with standard male friends, Cruz and Deal. Cruz and Deal have geeky conversations about things like Bilbo Baggins versus Thor versus Wonder Woman, the kind of stuff all geeks dabble in. And they're kind of Big Bang Theory-esque geek stereotypes, just there to signal, this is a geeky work. Cruz and Deal are ample sources of that kind of masculine standoffishness I really hate, and I am so glad when they disappear for most of the book. There's also a school bully named Notcher, who harasses the three friends. Notcher is a stereotypical bully with a Freudian excuse because his dad is abusive, but that doesn't really excuse his acts of evil, and I think that's the best way to handle it. Notcher is also homophobic and insults Zack by calling him gay, but the book handles the homophobia fairly well by having Zack be upset more by the harassment than the fact that he's being called gay, and by later including positively depicted gay characters, thereby sending the message that it's okay to be gay, which is something even Harry Potter couldn't manage to do. Who said you're your boyfriend? <laughs> no, Dumbledore doesn't count. He's never indicated to be gay at all throughout the whole series, regardless of what Joe Rowling said afterwards. And no, Hermione doesn't count as black representation either. Zack has anger issues and often gets in fights with the jerk, earning him the nickname Zack Attack. This is most likely a reference to Ender's Game, where Ender viciously attacks his harassers to send a message to anyone else who might want to pick on him. That is really important to Ender's character and a theme about the justification of war. But despite an early emphasis on Zack's anger issues, there is little to no payoff for this fact. It means that the EDA holds off on recruiting him until they're really desperate for new drone operators, but this ends up mattering very little, so it seems like a reference with no point. Zack's father, Xavier Ulysses Lightman, also Azul, 
died when Zack was only a baby, and Zack has passionately been trying to make a connection with the figure of his father by watching his father's favorite shows and reading his favorite books. Xavier was a massive geek, and Zack follows in his footsteps by embracing, you guessed it, 80s sci-fi. Just so Klein isn't limited in his 80s references, Zack has his mother to flesh out his knowledge of 80s pop culture. Zack's mother, Pamela, is an attractive single mother who is also as tough as nails and is also a geek into World of Warcraft. She comes across as like a shield against feminist criticism. Zack goes into detail on how much he respects her, how beautiful she is, how she's essentially Sarah Connor, and she's even into video games, really broadcasting the idea that Klein respects women. There's also a thing about Zack observing pervy men trying to take advantage of his beautiful mother and how this made him dislike his own gender, which could be an interesting character trait but is never brought up again. So I really think it's just thrown in there to say, look how feminist friendly I am. It's really a token effort though, because Pamela is pretty irrelevant to the plot except as a generic mother figure. The fact that she's a nurse becomes useful during the European invasion, so she's not useless, but all of those informed, feminist-friendly traits could be cut out without affecting the plot at all. Zack happens to be one of the top 10 Armada players, so he is selected among various other players to operate combat drones sent to Europa for the first big retaliatory strike. He and his friends play the mission, thinking that it's just a game, and Zack narrates about playing the game. I'm sorry, but reading about people playing video games is boring. It's the same flaw of Halo the Flood. You don't want to read about Master Chief going through the levels of Halo. You want to play Halo. Armada is going to be adapted into a film, and I imagine depicting the game visually will remove a lot of the awkwardness present in reading about someone playing a video game. That said, there is a point to describing the game this way. The first time he operates a combat drone, there is a lot of distance. He just thinks he's playing a game. The second time, he knows what's going on, and it's more personal. The third time, he's actually in the cockpit, all distance removed. However, knowing this doesn't erase the fact that it's awkward to read about someone playing a video game. The Europans send a huge invasion fleet to Earth, and the EDA recruits the best players from their training simulations. An EDA spaceship, just like one from the game, lands in the school parking lot, and the men in black abduct Zack to bring him to a recruitment facility in Nebraska called Crystal Palace. He's given a QCOM, which is kind of a smartphone wristband he can use to contact other EDA members, and he's given the automatic rank of lieutenant because of his video game skills. The rate that these characters power through the ranks just because of their video game skills is so absurd that I feel it has to be a parody of books like John Scalzi Old Man's War, where the protagonist soars through the ranks within a relatively short time span. This is one day. The whole alien invasion, 90% of the book, takes place in one day. Keep that in mind. It's here in Crystal Palace that Zack meets his love interest, Alex Larkin, a hot gamer girl even more hardcore of a geek than he is. This is not a new trope. Heinlein did it in his 1956 short story, The Menace from Earth. And it might be older than that, I don't know. More recently, Cory Doctorow did it in 2008 with Little Brother. I don't think there's anything sexist about the trope, and there is potential for feminist effect, but I do want to emphasize that it's not alien to the classic sci-fi male fantasy. It's an old male fantasy trope. A lot of people criticize this book for stupid reasons, like they say it's a ripoff of The Last Starfighter, even though it's an homage more. Another thing they say is that this character is unrealistic. She's fairly realistic, I've seen that type. She seems like she could be a member of Pandora's Mighty Soldiers or something like that. She dresses kind of punk, has geeky tattoos, and she is the first in this set of recruits to disassemble their QCOM and hack the OS to enable extra options. I'm pretty sure I've seen women like that walking around Dragon Con. It might be a sexist take to presume that people like that don't exist. From a feminist perspective, she's okay. She's just kind of bland. That's a problem a lot of the characters have. They just reference pop culture while Zack narrates around them. Alex is more interesting than Riley from Buffy, but not a lot. She makes references and takes digs at things. And she's a bit subversive, but not a lot. She and Zack hit it off, they kiss, and she jailbreaks his QCOM for him. So her strength does serve a purpose, and right away, she's just bland. 
She also derisively calls him princess when he gets emotional, which is sexist and aggrandizing of toxic masculine ideals, demonizing men's emotional vulnerability. Men should be free to have the full range of emotion, and the demonization being associated with femininity just sends the message that being feminine is bad. She essentially positions herself as not like other girls, because she has strength like the best version of a man, making her a bit of an anti-Buffy. This would be a small point if the characters were written well, and if there were characters to contradict this theme that she puts forward, but that's not how it is. The Europons attack Crystal Palace while the recruits are there, and for the first time, Zack knowingly pilots a drone into battle. He does a good job until the end, when the base leader, Major Vance, gives him an order to back off. Zack thinks that he knows better and mutes the channel, thus leading to the destruction of a lot of military equipment. <laughs> this point. It focuses on the consequence of giving the reins to a player who cares more about the gameplay than the plot. He's the type to skip the cutscenes and get straight to the action. So, you finally arrived here to save Prince? I've been waiting for- Stop skipping my dial! Seriously, stop- Mother fuck! Which is fine when playing a game, but disastrous in real life when ignoring a superior officer during a battle. This also showcases one of the obvious flaws in bringing gamers into battle. The consequences of losing are completely different. Despite this huge mistake, he gets sent to a base on the moon to join the other top players in a special task force. The base is called Moon Base Alpha, and everyone is just shocked that it's real. I'm not sure if it's supposed to be an element from the Armada game or NASA's real-life simulation game. Either one seems plausible. The leader of the task force is the top player in Armada, who uses the username Red Jive, a reference to Luke Skywalker's call sign Red Five. When Zack joins the task force, the other members are involved in a debate as to the identity of their mysterious leader. Debbie, a middle-aged woman and mother of two, suggests that it's sexist to presume that Red Jive is a man. Milo, an angry, hairy, overweight nerd, says that it makes sense that Red Jive would be a man, because Red Five was, and because only men make good pilots, proceeding to own himself by only naming fictional characters. Wody, a black teenage girl, owns him by naming Marie Marvinkt, and by describing how women make good pilots after all. Also, I thought of High Wizardry by Diane Duane, which has its teenage girl protagonist use Red Five as her username. The exchange very overtly inserts a feminist narrative into the plot, and unlike the informed Pamela traits, it works. Good job! Also in the task force is Xiang Chen, hope I'm saying that right, a Chinese guy who can barely speak English and mostly communicates through his QCOM translator. The language barrier makes communication awkward, and there is an emphasis on Zack having trouble understanding what he's saying, but fortunately there's no racist humor. He's handled very respectfully, with Zack even trying to repeat his Chinese motivational statements, instead of trying to teach him English ones. The task force is nicely diverse. Debbie is the only religious one in the group, which is a little awkward until Wody starts quoting Bible verses. Even if she's not religious, her uncle is, and she knows a lot of scripture. Her uncle also has a thing for Shakespeare, and she provides thematic public domain quotes. I like that aspect. It seems to be saying that being really into the Bible or the Bard is the same thing as being a geek and making pop culture references. It's considered classier, but it's really the same thing, and not to be disparaged by the modern agnostic geeks. As it turns out, Red Jive is actually Xavier. The EDA faked his death to bring him on as a full-time drone operator. Zack spends some time getting to know his dad, and it's a nice family thing. As fathers go, Xavier is kind of like a cross between Poseidon from the Percy Jackson books and Benjamin Sisko from Deep Space Nine. And I also suspect he's a self-insert of the author. There's a very telling passage. Xavier could either join the EDA and use his video game skills to try to help save humanity, or he could, as he said, puss out and keep waiting through sewage for a living until aliens show up and destroy our planet, along with my wife, my baby boy, and everyone else I know and love. I feel this captures the essence of this sort of fantasy. The guy joins a fictional air force to use his video game skills to try to help save humanity. It's the passion no one expects to come to anything being used for not just a military purpose, an effort to save humanity. Or he could puss out, which is a sexist phrase associating weakness with femininity, and just do an unglamorous but otherwise responsible job. 
It isn't a responsible choice, however, because there are special circumstances in place to make it cowardly, and this gives him the masculine responsibility to take care of his family, which will be accomplished by playing video games. It really defines Armada as this masculine fantasy. Xavier tells Zack a conspiracy theory of his, that the aliens aren't really fighting a war, that it's all just a simulation. Their behavior isn't just what informed video game cliches. It's something that only makes sense in a video game. His theory fits into Zack's nitpicking the plot of the Armada video game when he thought it was fictional, so it's an interesting case of geeky nitpicking being used as a skill to save humanity. The two of them come to believe that it's just an elaborate test of humanity's capacity for pacifism by sending out waves of increasingly difficult opponents with clear weak points to give incentive both for surrender and attack. Strange game. The only winning move is not to play. But it's hard for them to really embrace the idea that they shouldn't attack when the Europans are actively attacking. The fleet is close enough that the EDA comes clean to the Earth and prepares them for the attack. Interestingly, the president is female. This came out in 2015, before the Never Trump thing, so it's not specifically Hillary Clinton must win, and probably will, it's just suggesting that there could be a female president. I like the character in 24. Good job! Everyone starts making last-minute preparations, such as getting it on before they all might die. Zack walks in on Milo and another guy trying to romance each other, and he awkwardly leaves. The reveal that they're gay is handled really well, and it adds some depth to Milo, who is otherwise just an aggressive nerd cliché. On the other hand, he is one of the first to die when the Europans attack, but if there is a sin and punishment dynamic, his sin is more likely to be associated with his jerkishness than anything else. The Europans land a disruptor on Earth, a really big threatening weapon. The book compares it to a Death Star, but it reminds me more of the World Engine from Man of Steel. The task force rides special spaceship fighter jets from the moon down to the disruptor to fight it in person. When news comes of his sister's death with the fall of Shanghai, Chen suffers a nervous breakdown and performs a suicide attack on the disruptor, causing a split-second opportunity for Xavier to destroy it by pulling off a similar maneuver but ejecting. Both of these likely an homage to the scene at the end of Independence Day. Sack muses a bit on how video game players aren't trained for the horrors of war, which is another one of the huge flaws in the premise, but it doesn't go anywhere. Using the special features Alex added to his QCOM, Sack rescues his father and takes him home for his mother to take care of. He contacts Alex, who is now a captain, because why not? And they collect allies to pass the conspiracy theory to the heads of the EDA, a group that includes famous scientists like Neil deGrasse Tyson and Stephen Hawking. I so hope they cameo in the movie. They observe collected data and agree with the theory. They share the important detail left out of EDA propaganda that Nixon started the war because he wanted to nuke the space Nazis. So the Europans are actually retaliating instead of just being hostile aliens. The scientists decide to halt a mission to activate a weapon of mass destruction on Europa. However, Major Vance is so convinced that he's in the right that he launches a coup. The task force has to fight against him, with Xavier killing him in a suicide attack. Zack takes control of one of the drones at Europa and destroys the weapon of mass destruction. The instant he does, the game ends. Humanity learned that the only winning move was not to play. So the alien intelligence behind the European drones, a giant spherical robot called the Emissary, working for an alien sodality, concludes the test. I get the sense that it's an homage to Gort, from the day the Earth stood still. The Emissary asks if humanity wants to join the sodality and reap the benefits of free energy and cures for diseases, and Zack accepts. So he may be a traitor of a sort, but he's also a hero. Kind of an anti-ender. Zack also notes that the Stolity is a bit evil, because its big test involved killing millions of people. But all of that is brushed aside for the big wrap-up about him being a hero. Aside from being a power fantasy, Armada is a hurricane of pop culture references. It seems like every paragraph is a chance for a geek to laugh because they recognize the reference, or to feel alienated because they're not in the in-group enough to understand it. I personally love pop culture references, and I enjoy works that respect people's knowledge of pop culture and give a loving nod to the community, but I don't feel a sense of respect from Armada. It's more like pretentiousness. As I see it, there are basically three kinds of pop culture references. 1. References that form our vocabularies. Darmok and Vilad at Tanagra. 2. References that exist for showering fandoms with love. And 3. Just referencing things to show off one's knowledge of stuff that exists. 
The first kind works from how the stories we know form our knowledge of the world and allow us to construct phrases to communicate complex ideas. So you said you had a plan, how we might convince them to let us pass. Wookie. Right now, Echo is experiencing extreme sensory overload. And that could lead to a coma state. Or it could turn her into Carrie at the prom. These references communicate complex ideas and short, concise phrases. The second kind is like wearing a t-shirt to show your appreciation for a fandom, or collecting action figures, or decorating the side of your spy van with an elaborate Death Star image. It doesn't serve a purpose other than showing off that you like a certain fandom and elements within it. But that can be affirming to people who like that too, or who otherwise like to see people openly displaying their passions. The third kind is a way to establish in-group and out-group by referencing things familiar to the in-group. And it can easily turn into pretentious geeky crap where people who want to feel important just name a million things. That's the kind of annoying crap that characters like Milo pull. These three kinds of references are listed in descending levels of quality. A work that can knit its dialogue together in Type 1 references is almost assured for success. This is where Joss Whedon really shines. This is one of the highlights of Veronica Mars. Type 2 is also good in a general way, but a work cannot stand on Type 2 as one of its main selling points. That's why the Big Bang Theory doesn't fly with a lot of geeks. At the end of the day, it's just saying that geeks exist. That's fine, it can be affirming, but there needs to be more than that. Type 3, however, is not good on its own. It doesn't add to the work. It just shows that the author knows things, or maybe look them up, so that people can respect him for his geeky cred. Armada has all three types, but the ratio is vastly skewed in the direction of type 2 and type 3. The fact that geeks exist is the main pillar it rests on, and it just shoots out a scattershot of references to prove that the author knows a lot of geeky works. The characters do things geeks do, and they adjust their workstations to show off their passions, and I imagine the EDA is fine with it because it was all their propaganda in the first place. So we have this affirming Earth's mighty gamer army, and it just ends up geeks displaying their geek cred by being into all the stuff that Ernest Cline is into. Aside from Lodi's public domain Bible verses and Shakespeare, no one really has a passion for something that Zack the Mary Sue isn't into. And it all just turns into one big in-group. The 80s stuff especially is very contrived. And like with Ready Player One, there is a sense of pretentiousness with him saying that the 80s are more special, instead of accepting all of the years of science fiction evolution, like a normal geek does. He really feels like an old man ranting about the youngsters with their baggy pants and that music they listen to. There's a nod to modern gamer memes like Leroy Jenkins and The Cake is a Lie, but there's a prevalent sense of real geeks liking the deep cuts of the past generation and Zack being superior to geeks like Cruz and Deal for it. The book suffers thematically as well. Apparently, fascism is A-OK -okay if you get to play video games to save the world. At no point does Zack feel violated by learning that his favorite fandoms were constructed as propaganda by a worldwide Illuminati created to draft teenagers into a secret military. No, it's just him feeling patriotic because he gets to defend Earth from aliens and validated for his geeky interest because gaming enables world saving. Ultimately, that's an anti-geek message because it indicates that there's nothing important about being passionate for fandoms in the real world, where there is no conspiracy. I get the attraction of having a community where people respect geeks, but we already have that. They're called cons. We have built communities where we can be respected in spite of the disrespect of the prevailing culture, and that shows value in being subversive. If a con united to save the world, it would be more in the spirit of geekiness than in this book. This book promotes fascism. While there are bad people in the EDA, they are treated as bad apples that can be excised to renew the innate goodness of the EDA. Even the reveal that Earth struck first doesn't invalidate that presumed goodness. It was just Nixon, a historical bad guy. The EDA as an institution is never presumed to be anything other than a force of empowerment. That theme endorses fascism, and it runs contrary to items of influence like Ender's Game, which very carefully muses over moral issues and paints its fascist government as fundamentally immoral. Geeks can be powerful forces for good, but the EDA doesn't enable that. It's also weird because there are multiple references to They Live, which is extremely subversive. Did the author miss the whole point of that movie? 
From a feminist perspective, it's okay. It's not bad like some male fantasies I've read, and it does make an effort to be feminist friendly, but it comes from the masculine side of geekdom and contains some of the general problems running throughout that culture. Characters are sexist and Zack makes no effort to challenge them. Sometimes female characters are there to stick up for themselves, and sometimes not. And Zack, despite supposedly having this paranoid distrust of the male gender, does nothing because it doesn't affect him. There is a scattering of female characters with enough strength that the author and his fans can point to in order to defend the book from feminist criticism, but they're not well thought out and will function as decoy shields to distract from the other problems going on. There is just a fundamental disaffected masculine tone, and there is no representation of a more feminine side of geekdom, like fanfiction or yaoi or shipping, fan art or cosplay. It's nothing awful, but it's nothing special either. Overall, reading this book is like eating a cupcake. It's enjoyable while you have it, but once you finish it, you don't look back on it as this wonderful experience. You either look for another one like it, or you have something different to remove the too sweet aftertaste. I've noticed, however, that visual adaptations tend to smooth over some of the rougher elements of prose books, so I have hopes that the movie will eliminate some of the problems while retaining the feminist aspects. We shall see. Play the game, play the game, play the game.